and in another city up there, those are the two cities which is we called it Bitham and Ramses. And then Moses gathered the Israelites in the night of the Passover from the two cities and they marched all the way till number 60. This part here, what we call the Thokos in our map, which is number one in the map I give it to you in the bus, that is the first encamping station. And then Moses leads the Israelites to another location, we called it Etham or Etham. And the, the description of Etham, it's an area between the border of the uh, desert from one side and the Greenland from one side. So we believe it was somewhere nearby this area here. And he was going towards Baal Zephon, which is meaning north. So he's going from here from number 60, somewhere up like that in this area. And then the Pharaoh and he selects 600 chariots from his own army to go to after the Israelites and chase them and bring them back or kill them because of the death of his firstborn son. So he started to chase the Israelites. God would like to gain glory from the death of the Pharaoh and his chariots. So he makes the Israelites go in circle for one day. They didn't know what is the right way. They go in circle for one day. And then when they encamp in one location, they, all of a sudden they find the army behind them and a table of vulture in front of them. And I say a table of vulture, not a sea. Because actually, if you are saying that they are coming from here and they go to the north direction and they go in circle, that's meaning they were in this area here. The Red Sea down there. That is the Red Sea. So if they cross the Red Sea, that's meaning they had to go to the south, not to the north. And that is this according the word of God. Second, what we have, it's what we call it, the Hebrew version of the Bible, of the Old Testament. It's mentioned in it, the name of the sea, Yam Suf. Yam Suf in Hebrew language meaning sea of reeds, not red sea. Reeds sea. This area here is a very salty water. The Red Sea is a very salty water. No reeds grow by the by both sides of it. And we will go along today for over than two hours going along with the Red Sea and you will not see any plantation by the sides of it. So no way to be Red Sea having reeds. To have reeds, we need to have a brackish water, like something like a lake, which is having some fresh water mixed with salty water, so we got reeds growing there. We have a canal here, connecting between a branch from the River Nile, going all the way to this area. That's why we have some opinions now of the crossing point. Four different opinions. I will not tell you which one is the right one, and which one is the wrong one, because no one knows except God. All what I will say is explaining the four of them and then it's up to you to believe in which one you like. Number one, here, we're number 80. And this one here is a big lake now. This lake part from the Suez Canal now. But it was existing that inch on time, a very big and huge lake. And this one we call it now Bala Lake. B-A-L-A-H Lake. Bala Lake. And then we have another lake here, we called it the Great Butcher Lake. And this one between number 25 and 27, this one could be the second option for crossing point. The third option, the people who believe it is Red Sea as it is in English and no one could change it. So they believe here that one of those locations starting from here all the way down could be the Red Sea. And that is the location of the crossing point somewhere in this area because we know that they cross in the third night so they go out from in the night of the bus over slept one night here one night up there or one night in Etham and in the third day they cross or in the third night they cross so as a human being carrying their household having their elders having their children having their uh, livestock how long a man could walk for one day? 10 miles. Let us say they are, as the Bible says, they were walking by day and night. So let us say that they are walking for 20 miles per day. In three days, 60 mile radiation coming from here. 
So if we make a radiation for 60 miles, 60 miles will cover the distance till here or there, or maximum, if it is the Red Sea, it will be here. No way to be in one of those places. So one, two, three, one of those places could be the crossing point. And that's what we were believing in it until the year 1987. 1987, we have a new schooler, a new professor from Tennessee, from the United States. His name is Professor Ron White. He was doing some excavation in this eastern part of Sinai. Eastern part of Sinai, by the time of 1967, it was under the incubation of the, incubation of the Israeli army. And he still like that till the year 1982. 1978, he was making some excavation in this area, and in this location, he discovered a pillar. May a pillar. Clomen, pillar, and this pillar made out of granite stone in this area, and this pillar has some handwriting on it. It is in ancient or old Hebrew language. He tried to, most of it eroded, but he tried to find and read some words in it. And the words he read as Solomon, Egypt, Edom, Egypt in Hebrew, Mazraim, and Edom, and Chariots, Pharaoh, cross it looks like crosswords a puzzle so some he start to search in the history of solomon because it's mentioned solomon in the beginning so he start to search in the history of king solomon and he finds some stories saying that king solomon in his reign he come he erected two pillars by the two sides of the red sea to commemorate the crossing story so he start, he find one here. The other one's supposed to be in the other side. So he start to search in the other side. The other side belongs to Saudi Arabia. 1987, he discovered in this part here another pillar. But the Saudi Arabia say, no, you are not allowed to discover and dig here in this area. And they prevent him and any scholar from going to this place. And this one disappeared, the pillar disappeared, and we don't know where it is. And they put a flag instead of it. And they're preventing anyone from digging in this place. And they transferred the whole area to become a military territory. So no one could go there. By the year 1989, he has a permission from the Saudi government, and he go to what we call it Ar Riyadh University. And he do like a presentation for them, explaining to them what is the story and if he succeed to discover things here, it will help people to understand the right way of history and maybe the mountain of God is not in Egypt, it's in Saudi Arabia and that will attract uh, uh, a lot of people and we will rewrite the history he took for six hours. After and then when he finished, he took a look. He was making like a light system in, in his face, so he didn't see the people who are audience. And then when they turn off the light, he find all of them sleepy and no one pay any attention, and they refuse to give him the permission. That's why this one of the new theory, but we don't have any accurate information and digging yet. But it motivates others people to start to search about evidence in this area. And what happened is, by the year 1985, 1985, we have a Swedish scuba divers. They start to go down here and diving under the water in this area and try to search for something underneath here. Because we know if this one here, it is a real actual crossing point, so we could have something under the ground or under the water. What they discover is they have, let us say, the level of the sea, the bottom of the sea. It goes down like that. And then in the middle between the both sides, we have like a land bridge higher than the rest of the level of the bottom of the sea. And over this land bridge, they have a lot of coral reefs. They do a lot of researches and they find out wheels of chariots made out of wood covered with gold. Bones of horses and human beings. 
So they believe maybe those horses are the Egyptian horses and those the chariots of the Egyptian Pharaoh, the 600 chariots, and those maybe the soldiers of the Egyptian army who sink under the water and God gain glory from their deaths. But what I'm saying is, may be, we don't have any accurate information yet. While we understand also from the word of God that is King Solomon, he bought from Egypt chariots, 1400 chariots, he bought it from Egypt and he paid for each chariot, golden chariot, he paid 100 shekel of gold and he paid for each horse, he got it from Egypt, 150 shekel and he was married the daughter of the Egyptian Pharaoh. So these those chariots are belong to the time of Solomon or it is the time of Moses? We don't know. We need to make more researches and more things. But let us say about the distance from here all the way up to the land of Goshen, if we make a radiation direct connection, it is 350 miles. Could a human being could walk 350 miles in only three days? It's a question to you to answer. I'm here just, I'm saying, giving you the opinions and then it's up to you to believe in what you would like to believe. This one here, it doesn't matter where the crossing point, we are following today together what we called it, the traditional road, the most recommended road. And the most recommended road taking us to the other side in Sinai in an area we called it wilderness of Shur. When they cross, they go through the wilderness of Shur for three days. Where is the wilderness of Shur? Here. So, if the crossing point there, no wilderness of Shur there. Wilderness of Shur is here. We're number 80 to 75 here in this map. That is the location of the wilderness of Shur. And then they go all the way down for three days and three nights until their water supplies is vanished. So they start to search for water. They find a spring of water, but the water was better. So Moses, God pointed to him a piece of a stuff of a tree. He scattered it in the water and the water became sweet. And they called the location Mara. That is this location, which we called it Moses Spring or Ayun Musa. Ayun in Arabic meaning spring is a water. Ayun Musa or Moses Spring. And that's our next stop where we are going to stop there. Mara. And then they go for a period of time until they find what we called it Elam. And in Elam, they have 70 palm trees and 12 springs of water. That is the location of Elam. And we will stop there. I'm sorry. We will stop there and we could take a photo there. And then after that, they go through what we called it Wilderness of Thin, where they have manna and quail gathered. And that is the location of Wilderness of Thin, where they got the manna and quail. And then, starting from here, we are not following the right road. Because the right road, taking us between the mountains, in a very narrow valley between the mountains, where they reach to one area here, we called it Rafidim. And Rafidim were the first battle between the uh, Israelites and the Amalekites. And that is when Moses climbed the mountain and he got the stuff of his hand. In, and then he raised his hand and praised the Lord all the day until the Israelites won the battle. And he built an altar in this area called it Lord is my panel. That is the only place we are not going to visit. Because after the uprising which has happened in Egypt in the last two years, we have some Bedouin people are taking over this place because they are growing drugs in this area. And they were against the Egyptian government and the Egyptian security. And that's why they kidnapped some tourists in this area. And that's why that is the place we are not going to visit. That is the only one we would like to avoid. And to avoid this one, unfortunately, it will push us to drive more distance. So instead of going from here all the way like that to the mountain of God, we are going surrounding, using this road, surrounding the whole triangle shape all the way, all the way, all the way until we go to the mountain from this side. That is adding six hours drive. But our first concern is safety. What about if we go from the short way and then when I go to Israel, you go missing two or three persons have been kidnapped in Egypt. No way. Okay? 
That's why after we cross this part here, sometimes we are driving alone, and sometimes the, we have what we call it a convoy from the police. And if we have a convoy, we had to wait until we gather the, they gather different buses going together up to they know what who are crossing the, the road today, and they have one police escort car going with us in the road itself to be sure that we are safe enough. That is almost the whole story about what we called it the Exodus Road and what we are going to do today in our tour. But in the modern time, something like 1869, they have a different way to make this area flourish. We have here what we called it the Red Sea, and that is the Mediterranean. And then the Egyptian government decided to dig a canal. We say before that we have three different lakes, one, two, three, exist already in this area. So they decided to connect between those lakes by digging a canal, and they are using this canal as a shortcut way, transferring products and big boats and ships and things like that from, e from the Red Sea all the way to the Mediterranean. And that is saving much time. Because before that time, they were going surrounding the whole Africa continent, and that's taking much time. It's a very dangerous place, and they are losing money and time and everything. That's why they are using this one now, and they dig the canal in 10 years, starting from the year 18. 59 till the year 1869 number of the workers who are digging this canal are two million workers all of them from egypt and when they finished the canal it became like that come closer to this side please 